to tell us how to raise the net zero conversation. Please welcome back Professor Miles Allen. Thank you, Ron. Well, thank you very much, and, and well done, all of you, for braving the rain uh, to come out this evening, and uh, welcome to those online as well. I wanted, so we're getting on to how we get there, um, how we're going to, to achieve net zero, and th this imp the importance of raising the conversation um, is really up to you, um, because the, the main point of these lectures this year is we need a much bigger public discussion of how we get to net zero. Uh, we've been um, sort of essentially told, don't worry, um, the government has it all in hand um, until it turns out it doesn't. Um, so we need to actually all engage much more with this to, act, to if we're going to avoid net zero becoming a very divisive political issue. And I, I, I started talking about this in the last lecture, if those of you who are here um, just before the summer, because we had an election just coming up and, and uh, I, I sort of couldn't resist um, getting into uh, these topics. But I'll be um, really focusing on this this year, looking at the, the different climate solutions, different approaches to climate solutions. We, we won't be going through in detail, you know, how to fit a heat pump, sorry, uh, if, if, if to manage your expectations on that. Um, but we will be talking about large-scale approaches to addressing climate change. And uh, that's really what we need the conversation to be about, how we set about achieving net zero. I, I don't want the conversation to be about whether to bother. I was hearing there's still people out there who require convincing that we need to bother. Um, but um, I think increasingly we're moving on from that position. And the argument is about how we do it um, rather than whether. Um, and I'm going to try and explain to you, uh, and this is, is my view, it, it's not a view perhaps shared by many uh, others who work in the climate space, that net zero policy is fundamentally different from climate policy. And this is a problem from traditional climate policy. Uh, and this is a problem because since, you know, we, we established the need for net zero back in um, 2009, it's now generally accepted but the way our government, and indeed most people in the climate policy community, seem to react to this is, well, we need to do traditional climate policy, but just, you know, dialed up to 11. We just need to do more of what we thought we were going to do anyway. If you look at the climate policies that people are talking about today, they were all around before we discovered the need for net zero. And I'm going to try and convince you that, in fact, the flagship climate policy, so-called carbon pricing, um, it, it's, it's a great policy for getting emissions down, but it's not the policy that's going to get us all the way to net zero. Um, and f finally, I'm going to say some provocative things, perhaps, to my economist friends about um, what it will actually take to get to net zero in terms of policy. But before we get on to the how question, I think it is important to remind ourselves what net zero is for, because, surprisingly, it's, it's got quite confused in many people's minds and, and has be just become conflated with generally trying very hard at uh, climate, at reducing emissions. That's sort of a, a lot of, when companies set net zero targets, you actually ask them, well, what do you intend to do? You get a list of things they're going to do, which are just what they were going to do anyway. They're just, clim just general climate targets. So net zero is about stopping global warming. It's what it takes to halt global warming. Halt being this sort of careful word that we chose because it's not necessarily going to stop it forever, but it's certainly going to stop it carrying on up for, for several decades. And so in the left here, you've got, you've, you know, I've showed you this, remember those, those, those of you who are here in the year one, we had those plastic tubes to show you how all this worked. Some people are laughing because they can remember that it didn't work very well. Um, so we, if we reduce emissions, um, all the, the net emissions from fossil fuel use and deforestation um, down to zero, uh, that's the left-hand panel here, um, then carbon dioxide concentrations will stop rising and start to fall again, crucially, and that will be enough to stabilize global temperatures. And as that carbon dioxide levels are falling, remember that carbon dioxide's not disappearing, it's not, it's not turning into anything else. Carbon dioxide's a very stable, gas, it, 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 there's, there's nothing 
can really react with it. So it's being taken up by the oceans and the biosphere. And that green line below the zero line in the emissions graph shows you, the fr right now, the fraction of our emissions that's taken up every year by the oceans and biosphere. And fortunately for us, that carries on even after we reach net zero. And that's enough to draw down atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide and stabilize global temperature. We'll come back to that, and that's one of the really important policy discussions that's going on at the moment, the topic of offsetting um, this rather nerdy relationship between carbon dioxide and, um, uh, <coughs> and, and the different um, sources and sinks of carbon dioxide. It turns out to be highly relevant to the whole offsetting debate. Um, we talked in the second year, so last year, we talked about why it's a good idea to get on with uh, getting to net zero, um, having established it's what it takes to stop global warming. When do we have to get there um, was the topic of last year's lectures. And you know, again, I, I just re reorganized things a bit to put the, the temperature response in the middle here. Again, that's the emissions on the right. And if I just sort of change the date at which we get to net zero, that's 2050 is the standard one we aim for. That'll level us out something like just a bit over one and a half degrees. Um, if I delay for a year, I, having st still starting reductions now, but, but um, just getting there a little bit slower, um, we end up a little bit warmer. Just that 10 years slower adds about a tenth of a degree. Um, and if I just carry on you know, going later and later, you can see that the temperature goes up. If I delay towards the end of the century, I'm quite likely to end up around two degrees. And if I delay past the end of the century, we're going to carry on warming past two degrees. On the right, um, if, you, if you were all focusing in, I think it was January's lecture of this year, about the economic harm done by climate change, that, that purple line is an, sort of, it's an indication, only an indication, of the economic harm done by climate change expressed as a fraction of global, uh, global income, global GDP. Um, and the numbers in the vertical, they're not, they're not, they, they don't have any significance other than one being how much climate change is costing right now. And so, um, and I, I think if you recall that lecture, I was stressing the fact that we can kind of agree on the shape of how um, the global economy responds to rising temperature, even if we can't agree on the absolute numbers. And the reason, of course, we can't agree on the absolute numbers is because that involves difficult things like, you know, weighing up the value of a pensioner's life versus the value of a 30-year-old's life. Okay? I mean, that sounds like a totally outrageous thing to do, but believe it or not, if you actually want to assign a number to the cost of climate change, you have to make those calls. And you can imagine, so making those calls is very difficult, so very hard to come up with an absolute number um, for the, 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 the impact of, of, of climate change. But we can say, you know, whatever it is, um, the impact of climate change today is likely to, so if we, if we sort of um, limit warming to one and a half degrees, we'll see the impact of climate change go up to something over double what it is today in terms of economic harm, um, between two and three times. And then notice that as I delay and temperatures go up higher, the economic impact goes up ever faster because of that fact that the further you get away from pre-industrial climate, the faster um, the economic harm from any additional warming accumulates as we cross more and more thresholds and more and more systems are irreparably harmed. So that's why it's a good idea to get on with it. And the other important thing to remember about net zero, again, what we're not talking about this year, but what hopefully you've brought with you if you've been following these lectures up until now, is because carbon dioxide accumulates in the climate system, delaying getting started is at least twice as bad as taking longer to get there. And the reason for that is, of course, it's the back to the braking time analogy. If you hold off hitting the brakes, you've got much less and less time to actually stop. And right now, you know, this is what happens if we had started reductions in 2020. We didn't. If we delay 10 years, that adds, you can see, that adds almost a quarter of a degree to, um, to, global, uh, to the global temperatures we end up at. And you know, if we delay until 2040 starting emission reductions, 
then even with the same rate of decline, we're then probably going to end up around two degrees and four times as much damage as we're damage per year as we're experiencing at the moment. And of course, if we just carry on delaying, you know, off it goes off the top. So we need to get on with it. And therefore, we need a conversation. We need, we need to get people, everybody, on board um, with this um, enormous project that we have to address. So we should have started reducing emissions some time ago. That's definitely the, definitely the case. And until we get on with reducing emissions, the world will continue to warm. Which is why I find this sort of picture rather puzzling. Um, basically, what these people are saying is, the world's going to warm forever. Celebrate. And they're all very cheerful about that. Um, there are some philosophies for which this would be perfectly coherent. Um, Rumour had it, I've never heard this confirmed, that in the Bush, the GW Bush administration, there were several figures, including Donald Rumsfeld, who were adherents to the, um, the, the um, what, I can't, I'm trying to remember the name of it, the, the, the theory that basically in 2050, um, the saved would be taken up to heaven and everybody else would go somewhere else. Um, and if you believe this, of course, it makes their climate policy made perfect sense. Because if that's what's going to happen, then, then frankly, there's not a lot of point in worrying too much about climate change. And if somebody's telling you um, that they're not interested in net zero, it's worth sort of drilling down as to why not. Because some people are still you know, in denial that there's anything happening at all. But many people have moved to the opposite end of the spectrum of thinking, well, it's all hopeless. And that's why they don't like climate policy, because they've just given up. And depressingly, actually, many of the people who've just given up, actually, an, an, they're people who were in, environmentalists. And they've now just sort of given ways to despair. Um, I'm absolutely not in that position. People often ask me, you know, do you, do you, do you despair over climate? Because you sort of keep saying the same thing and, and nothing's happening. Things are happening. Um, the conversation is evolving. We need more people. We need more people involved in it. More people stepping up, and getting getting interested in how we achieve this. Um, and we need also to to to, to help. I, I I do wonder how many people waving around a no to net zero placard realise that they're not waving a no to you, Les placard. It's sort of they, they, these things have become almost interchangeable, um, and and that's the problem. Is that actually? And we're going to come back to this in the corporate net zero, the, the net zero is for corporations lecture later this, um, later this year. Um, but when all these corporations signed up for net zero, the environmental movement act, made an active effort to add more meaning to net zero than the scientists ever intended for it. So net zero means a whole lot of other things now, as well as what we meant. So this is why I wanted to remind you with those graphs of what we meant by net zero, what I mean by net zero, what net zero actually means. Um, because it's had lots of other things added to it which people don't like. Um, or, and, and so then they say, well, I don't like you know, whatever it is that I'm being told net zero means, um, and, and therefore I don't like net zero. So, well, which, of course, is, is a bit of a nonsense, because actually they probably, most of the people in that room probably don't want the world to warm forever. Some of them are quite young. They probably want to stop global, they would rather the global warming stopped. Um, so <coughs> that's why, um, you know, that, that's, that's why we need to have a much more, uh, as I say, open conversation about what to do about it. And remember, I mean, even net zero itself was considered quite radical back in 2009 when we came up with it. Because at that time, we'd had 20 odd years where the goal of climate policy was stabilization of greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. And if we go back to that little figure, the dotted line here shows you what happens if we do that, if we reduce emissions just enough to stabilize concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And you can see that doesn't require emissions to fall nearly as far. We only need to reduce them by 80% um, or so, um, and, and provided we carry on reducing them slowly. For, but we've got many, many decades before we need to get even remotely close to zero. And that would be enough to stabilize concentrations of greenhouse gases, but the world continues to warm. And that was the big finding in 2009, which meant we had to go beyond stabilization to net zero. 
Um, and countries got this, and they went further within six years, just to remind you, to sort of cheer you up. In Paris, um, 190 countries of the world agreed that they wanted to achieve a balance between anthropogenic emissions by sources and removals by sinks of greenhouse gases in the second half of this century, which you know, is, is essentially the countries acknowledging the need for net zero, or at least getting as close as they could agree to um, uh, acknowledge the need uh, for net zero. Unfortunately, um, the Paris Agreement isn't completely clear what's included in that removals by sinks. And if you remember, I talked about the fact that carbon dioxide concentrations come down because carbon dioxide is coming back out of the atmosphere and going back into the oceans and uh, the land. Um, and if you, you so this, this means that there's actually a very large amount of carbon being taken up by Mother Nature that is potentially available to be sold on the offset markets. Um, and this is a huge problem. I'm not going to explain this whole problem now, but I do want to advertise the fact that we are having an entire lecture devoted to the problem of carbon offsetting, because if instead of reducing emissions, we just sort of traded around, particularly if we're trading around carbon that's being taken up naturally anyway, um, we're never going to actually stop global warming. And this is becoming a huge problem. Um, there's enough vagueness in what the Paris Agreement means by removals by sinks that we could, half the world's emissions could be relabeled net zero without anybody avoiding any emissions at all. So we could all just carry on doing exactly what we're doing and half of us could claim to have achieved net zero already. Um, uh, so, so that's, um, if you're, if, if you, this should worry you, it certainly worries me, um, because many of people probably around here in the city of London are happily trading carbon, think they're doing the right thing, they're buying these carbon offsets, they think their company's achieved its net zero goals and they're achieving absolutely nothing at all. So we need to talk about this. It doesn't mean that no carbon offsetting could ever work, um, and we will talk about what carbon offsetting needs to mean to actually work, um, but there are major problems in that industry at the moment. Because at the end of the day, solving climate change, as I frequently reiterate in these uh, lectures, is it's not complicated. You know, the, the lines behind me, you know, if you, you know, you need to reduce that emission one to zero, you need concentrations to come down, that stops the warming. But we, ever since realizing it was this simple, um, there's been a sort of lot of efforts at complicating it, um, and we're going to be talking about one of the one of the institutions or groups of institutions that have done perhaps almost the best job of complicating net zero is the fossil fuel industry, and we're going to be talking about the fossil fuel industry um, on the 26th of November. That's our, our next lecture, just before we have another COP in a petro state in uh, Azerbaijan. Um, it's a good time to be talking about the role of the fossil fuel industry, both in the general confusion around net zero and also in the solutions to it and the fact that the fossil fuel industry does need to step up. Um, and it, the way it's going at the moment, it's not only risking uh, the future of the planet, but it's risking the pensions of anybody who's invested in it, which is probably most of us. Um, so they're, 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 they're flailing around rather at the moment. Um, <coughs> beyond you know, looking broader, um, it's not just the fossil fuel industry. Um, corporate, uh, the, the corporate world has done a pretty good job of confusing matters around net zero, and we're going to be talking about claims people make, science-based targets, greenwashing, and what I call brown scraping, um, which is basically, if you, greenwashing is painting your activities green. Brown scraping is getting rid of all the rubbish into the bin so that you can say, look, I'm green, but the rubbish is still there. So that's, that's a pretty popular activity uh, among corporates these days. Find a, find a sort of a little entity that nobody's looking too carefully at, stick all the rubbish into that, and then the rest of you looks grand. A couple of corporate types in the audience I know who are nodding sagely at this point, and yeah, you know exactly what I mean. Okay, um, finally, another complication, which I haven't mentioned at all, which we've barely mentioned throughout these lectures because I've really focused on carbon dioxide. Um, it would be wrong for me to get to the end of a sort of how net zero uh, series of lectures without talking about the other big greenhouse gas, methane, 
And of course, one of the most uh, prominent, and certainly the one which everybody's heard of, sources of methane is livestock agriculture. So we're going to be talking about, about methane in general, but specifically on the question of whether net zero means the end of livestock agriculture. I'm not going to give any spoilers on that one, so you'll have to come to that lecture to find out. So net zero is basically pretty simple. Um, is there an equally simple policy solution? If you ask many people around the world, solution to climate change is really straightforward, just put a price on carbon. And this has been the mantra from the world's economists and the environmental movement for 30 years or so. And this is indeed the, the, the approach to climate policy that I say hasn't changed as a result of net zero. Um, we even heard, I mean, it, it, despite the fact that it's, it, it sort of, it jars somewhat with net zero. Um, and, and some of the proponents of this sort of approach to climate policy have reacted, and I, I'm perhaps slightly mean of me, but um, so Chris Stark, who is actually a very um, senior role now in government climate policy, um, was the CEO of the Climate Change uh, co uh, Committee um, until recently. Um, you know, very much a proponent of this sort of traditional approach to pricing carbon out of the system is getting very exasperated with the way net zero policy sort of isn't really working with his um, preferred, um, uh, approach, uh, preferred approach to getting emissions down and was actually saying in an interview um, before the summer, well, maybe we should just stop talking about net zero altogether. Um, it's like, no, you should... You should think about why it is that net zero is such an uncomfortable topic of conversation. So that's, that's why we need to have these conversations. Um, so let's talk about pricing carbon, because it is, it is fundamentally a very good idea if what you want to do is get emissions down. So this um, graph, it's one of many um, versions of something that I suspect was invented by McKinsey, um, and it's called a marginal abatement cost curve. And what it shows you is lots of different things you could do to reduce emissions going from you know, left to right, and um, in order, arranged in order of more expensive per tonne of carbon avoided. So um, the, the dark blue ones are to do with transport, the um, brown sort of beigey colored ones are to do with power generation, green is agriculture and so on. So you can see moving from left to right, um, does that see, notice that big sort of chunk of orange in the middle? That's largely where you're um, replacing uh, fossil fuel power with um, solar and wind. And that costs a certain amount um, to do because solar and wind under some circumstances might require more capital um, than fossil fuel power. At the moment, actually, it's sort of getting fairly marginal as to, as to which one actually um, uh, uh, costs less. Um, you'll notice there's some little orange wedges even further over, which look even cheaper, so even, so even further over to, to the left. Um, that's why you're um, sort of replacing coal-fired power stations with gas, for example, which is an even cheaper uh, measure to reduce emissions. But then you sort of run out of things you can do in terms of power generation. You've decarbonized the grid, and then you have to start doing other things. So you've got a, a gray wedge there, which is sort of we have to start um, uh, cutting down on emissions in industry and so on. And we keep going through uh, over further further and further over to the right and then we get and, and it gets more and more expensive to get rid of the next um, uh, slug of emissions but crucially there's a lot of emissions that are relatively cheap to avoid so we uh, there's the general consensus is that for less than a hundred pounds per ton of carbon, which is, I'll show you in a minute, less than uh, many of the sort of carbon prices we effectively pay already, we could actually halve global emissions. And, and so, you know, if, if what you want to do is halve global emissions, then stick in a price on carbon, a relatively modest price, 100 pounds per ton, that's uh, mental arithmetic here, but 20 pence per liter of petrol, sort of annoying but tolerable, sort of, you know, if it was phased in over time, um, that, that, would be, that would be enough to halve global emissions. And it's a nice, simple, easy to understand policy, which is why um, it's been so much the sort of center of, of climate policy for, for decades. Um, and 
of course, there's, there's the, the right-hand end of this graph that we need to talk about, and we will, don't worry, we will come back to it. Um, and there is evidence that carbon pricing does work. A paper published only a few weeks ago, actually, um, uh, a, a group of e econometricians and others looked at lots of data over the world at the time that different policies were introduced and to see and use in very elaborate statistical methods to work out if they'd had any impact on actual emissions. And so I just pulled out the UK example here because it's sort of more familiar to us, but you can go to the paper and see lots and lots of different countries. Um, and you can see this is UK emissions from electricity generation alone. And if you look in the, in the, uh, in the bottom, the, all those little colored dots, those show where different policies were introduced over the past couple of decades um, that were targeting reducing UK electricity emissions. So you can see electricity emissions were coming down anyway, um, coming up to 2010, but then we had a whole bunch of climate policies were introduced around 2010, and most of those were around putting an extra price on high carbon sources of electricity. So we had an emission trading scheme introduced, which meant that um, uh, companies emitting large amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere had to pay for it, um, or buy certificates from other companies. So, so, so that was effectively a, a carbon price was introduced. Um, we had uh, a renewable feed-in tariff, which again was sort of the other side of a carbon price. If you, you can either price carbon or you can subsidize non-carbon. Economically, it sort of works the same way. Um, and the only thing which wasn't a carbon price around that time was there was a, uh, an, an announced ban on, I think it was building new coal-fired power stations. Um, so, and they, but so largely through implementing these carbon price-based policies, we pushed UK emissions down further than they would have gone anyway. That you can see from the red line, the red line is sort of what would have happened without these policies and the blue and black is what actually happened. And you can see that you know, emissions were coming down anyway, but you know, the policies definitely had an impact, or at least you know, it, as far as, in, as good as the evidence is that we can have, you know, the policies did have an impact. So I, don't, I, don't want to, I absolutely wouldn't want to tell you that, that conventional climate policies don't work. They absolutely do work um, to drive emissions down. And remember, these were relatively modest carbon prices we were talking about back then. It was um, the ETS price, the emission trading uh, scheme price was sort of wobbling around 20, 30 pounds per tonne, which is actually really low compared to many other carbon prices that are out there in the world. In fact, um, one of the um, sort of reasons um, carbon, climate policy sort of isn't really working very well at the moment, is an enormous variation in carbon prices across different parts of the economy. This, it's, this is a slightly out of date figure. Um, I, I couldn't find an up to date one, but um, I'm sure it exists if you look for it. Um, but this is from uh, Catapult Energy Systems uh, back in 2018. They just looked at the range of uh, price, carbon prices people were paying in different parts of the economy, and the size of the blob indicates the amount of emissions in that, in that, in that uh, activity. And you can see that you know, for some activities, we are effectively imposing a carbon price of you know, hundreds of pounds per tonne, um, and this is essentially what the government is paying to get emissions down per tonne of CO2 avoided in that sector, so sort of electrification of rail, if it were done purely as a climate measure, is extremely expensive as a way of getting down emissions. Now, that's a big if, and of course, the, there's all sorts of reasons we want to electrify rail, and so that's why looking at it as just a you know, price on carbon is probably not, not a great way of, 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 uh, of, of addressing this. But, um, but, but nevertheless, it does give you an indication of where the low-hanging fruit are. And the idea, you know, the, the point of, of this report and of many others like it is, you know, we're working really hard to reduce some emissions when there's actually much more somewhere else in the economy we could actually make much more progress on. And so, you know, for a given amount of money, um, we're not really spending it very efficiently if we have this huge range of effective carbon prices in the economy. So, um, you know, we, 
uh, and he, uh, the economists are almost certainly right, if you want to, oh, I mean, they, they are right, um, that if we wanted to find the most cost-effective way of reducing emissions, the right answer would definitely be an economy-wide carbon price. Um, so is this the solution? Do we just need an economy-wide carbon price and just raise it to solve the problem? Is this, is this the solution? We just need higher carbon prices. Let me remind you what the net carbon price is. It's not necessarily a tax. It could be lots of, it could, it's, it's the net impact of the policies you've got, on the one hand, to penalize carbon dioxide generating activities, or you know, other greenhouse gas generating activities as well, but we're focused on carbon dioxide here. So things like you know, an emission trading system, which we've had for many years, um, carbon taxes, fuel duties, and so on. Things, and any policy that's introduced explicitly to, to, to make it more expensive to generate carbon dioxide. And in, in addition to that, you have to add on subsidies for non-CO2 generating alternatives. So that's sort of another... I mean, economists will argue about this, whether the subsidies should be included in the carbon price. But if we're, if we're sort of among friends, um, we can kind of bundle all these things together. I mean, because essentially they have the same thing. They, they have the same effect. You can either subsidize the renewables or you can penalize the, the fossil um, source of energy and you, know, you, you change the economic logic of which one to use, and that's how you drive down emissions. So both of these, and, and so there's kind of subsidies, which we're also pretty fond of um, in the UK, things like feed-in tariffs um, and contracts for difference, where the government sort of guarantees the price of energy from, uh, from uh, you know, um, institutions like, like, like wind farms and so on. Um, and uh, uh, subsidies are really taken off uh, recently with the extraordinary um, Inflation Reduction Act in the US, which actually um, is pumping money uh, into uh, the green transition at, a, at an extraordinary rate. And, and you know, hats off to the Americans for doing this. It's having a huge impact. Um, I often uh, comment there's, there's very few pieces of legislation that you'll be able to see in the geological record. That's one of them. Um, so the, 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 the ambition of the Inflation Reduction Act is extraordinary, but it's entirely based on subsidies. Um, and I, 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 I think various economists blanch slightly as to what is going to happen in the long term. If you basically, you're, you're sort of trying to solve a problem on this scale by hosing public money at it. And crucially, neither of these things is very popular. Um, here are some um, pensioners in Australia who've just um, thrown out the Australian government. This was back in 2016, 17, I can't remember exactly when. Um, the Gillard government in, Aust uh, in Australia um, bravely introduced a rather small carbon tax. They promptly lost the election um, and, and frightened everybody in Australia from talking about carbon taxes for about a decade. Um, and, and even here, you know, on the, on the subsidy side, we see still plenty of um, invective from the likes of Matt Ridley, who, by the way, I, I, I know, and he's a nice, friendly chap, but you wouldn't have guessed it um, from the um, uh, tone of this headline. Um, but madness of our worship of wind, um, and talking about the amount of money we're spending on wind, which um, Matt Ridley really doesn't like. Um, so, um, the problem is that even the kind of subsidies we're, imposing, we're, we're providing at the moment, and the kind of carbon prices were imposing at the moment, which were at the sort of, you know, relatively modest level, um, uh, it's, uh, it's already getting people wound up. Um, and what really scares me is the right-hand side of this graph. How high will carbon prices actually need to go if we're going to use that approach to squeeze carbon out of the economy entirely? And you can see, you know, $100 a ton would get us halfway, but what's going to get us all the way? In fact, this sort of mysterious gray wedge here, which sort of fuzzes out, that's what the authors of this report said, non-abatable, meaning you'd need effectively an infinite carbon price to drive out those activities from the economy. So you'd have basically no, no option but to ban those activities entirely. And that's where you can see net zero policy really... Um, running up against the buffers, um, because this is where it's going to get, uh, this is where it's potentially going to get ugly. <laughs>
Because if we look at the scenarios uh, for what it takes um, to get to net zero, um, we're talking very high carbon prices indeed. This is a graph, a sort of spaghetti diagram of carbon prices in lots and lots of scenarios from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, which um, achieve different levels of peak warming. So that just focus on the light blue and dark blue ones. Those are sort of one and a half and two degree scenarios. And you can see, yes, it's a big spaghetti, but Many of them, it's a, it's a logarithmic scale in the vertical, and many of these scenarios, particularly the ones that limit warming to close to 1.5 degrees, they're talking like a thousand pounds per tonne of CO2 by mid-century. And if we, actually, if we unpack these in more detail, and this is a rather sort of nerdy plot, but, uh, but it does sort of show the strength of the evidence for this point, this is gathering all of these scenarios together. The gray circles indicate different assumptions about the future of society and the world economy, and the colors indicate levels of climate ambition, so levels of, you know, um, so blue is, you know, we really try hard to, to, to limit warming, and red is we really don't bother, um, dark red. And so you can see all of these scenarios, they, they follow a very clear pattern, which is the higher the carbon price in 2050, the lower emissions, but you can also draw a pretty much straight line through any one of these families of scenarios, and you find that those lines intersect zero in 2050 at around $1,000 per tonne of CO2. So it's a very consistent message coming through from all of these scenarios. If you want to get to net zero, you're talking that sort of money. $1,000 per tonne of CO2 is probably slightly mind-boggling. So let's essentially talk about what this means. Um, Julian All Allwood uh, at Cambridge has given us a, a vision for the future um, of a, 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 an absolute zero Britain um, in a report published in 2019. Uh, I, think, I think he's still, again, it, it, it's, it's been around for a few years now, but I think most, many people would still um, say this is the kind of thing we need to address. Um, I, I don't know if you can, can read the, um, the, 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 all, the, all of the words on this. I was just showing you that. But these are sort of the changes they imagined that would have to happen to get to squeeze CO2 emissions out of the UK economy entirely using, and that the sort of the, the thought exercise that they set themselves was using um, a, uh, only existing technologies in 2019. And in particular, they were very suspicious of any technology that involved disposing of carbon dioxide, so carbon capture and storage, or direct air capture of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere um, and disposal. And so they assume if we don't have those available, then the only way of getting the UK to net zero is to get the UK to absolute zero, meaning there's, there's no net at all. You've just got to stop using fossil fuels entirely. So what does that mean? Well, for certain activities, it means quite a lot because, you know, again, the report's authors reckon that on the time scale of the report, we wouldn't have um, aeroplanes that don't require kerosene, and therefore we're going to sort of, you know, close all our airports. And they, they, they allowed um, Heathrow, um, Gatwick, and Glasgow. No, Heathrow. Which one? Which, Heathrow, Glasgow, and Belfast get to stay. Everything else moves onto rail. And then um, in the 2040s, we phase out aviation entirely um, uh, for. Shipping, um, you know, because at the moment we don't have proven technologies um, that, that so for fossil-free shipping that would be deployable on that timescale. We have to um, stop shipping, um, and all food would have to come in through the Channel Tunnel. Um, and, you know, are technologies appearing, which would mean this wouldn't be true? Um, maybe, but um, we can't sort of necessarily guarantee that they will. That's the trouble, because they're all quite nascent. Ships, are, you know, there are test ships that are run on ammonia, for example, but they're very much, I think there's one vessel out there which, which is burning ammonia. Um, heating power down, so, you know, we, we, we'd have to um, manage on going back to, as people frequently point out, back to the temperature that rooms are typically heated at in the 1970s, which was significantly colder than it is today, and yet, um, you know, but how would that go? I mean, again, you've got to sort of imagine how this is going to go with the voters as we go through. Um, further down the list, um, you know, we've got uh, uh, beef and lamb phased out. Um, we'll come on to that 
um, in the in the livestock uh, uh, lecture, um, and essentially the the the. the the, the bottom line on this, this is a complete phase-out scenario for fossil fuels. We phase out fossil fuels from the UK economy entirely. You'll notice that after the no-entry signs, so to speak, we see certain activities growing again, and if you just see over on the right here, you'll notice lots of these activities that sort of can establish themselves again after 2050 involve carbon capture and storage. This is if you, so, so essentially the assumption that Julian Allwood and his colleagues made was that we wouldn't actually develop carbon capture and storage until the mid-century. It wouldn't be available um, at scale, and so we just have to you know, go through this rather difficult period in the middle of the century where we just have to do without a lot of stuff, and then after that we'd be able to start um, using fossil fuels again with carbon capture and storage in order to um, get uh, available to get rid of the CO2. And so that's kind of, and it's a perfectly reasonable account of what would happen if you tried to eliminate fossil fuels completely from the UK economy and then only allow them to sort of to creep back in when carbon capture and storage was available um, if, you know, and as, as they assumed, um, that carbon capture and, and storage would not be available um, uh, for at least uh, 20 or 30 years. Um, I find this vision um, very difficult to imagine happening, and I think that overwhelmingly that you can imagine the, the, the public conversation about net zero, if that's what, you know, we, we haven't seen nothing yet, if this is the future um, that net zero has in store. So um, we will, by the way, be talking about other scenarios, for example, if, um, one of the, you know, obviously any scenario is a series of assumptions about the future. Um, both the integrated assessment model from the IPCC, though that spaghetti diagram of colored lines, um, and Julian Ward's report make assumptions about future prices of renewable energy and our ability to synthesize fuels from thin air and that sort of thing um, that might turn out to be wrong. So we might come up with an unlimited source of carbon-free energy in the 2030s, which would of course change this whole um, uh, the, the, the whole perspective. I mean, they might crack fusion tomorrow. Well, maybe not tomorrow, but they, you know, um, but not just fusion. Uh, you know, um, conventional renewable energy sources might get so cheap, and our ability to sort of synthesize fuels from from thin air might get so, so efficient um, that none of these choices need to get made, and that we can actually just phase out fossil fuels. Painlessly, there's, there's a growing body um, in the academic community who sort of argue strongly, including some of my colleagues in Oxford, that this is actually what's going to happen. That actually achieving net zero will be completely painless because it'll be cheaper to use um, uh, renewables than it will be for in, in all parts of the economy um, than uh, than uh, uh, than to use fossil fuels at all. So people will just sort of stop using fossil fuels on their own accord. We'll, we'll come back to this when we talk about the role of the fossil fuel industry in, and, and alternatives to it um, in, in the next lecture. Um, but I'm, I, I think we have to acknowledge the possibility that this very, very optimistic scenario for the future may turn out to be wrong. I'm not saying it's going to be wrong, but we just got to... No, let's not bank on it. It's a rather, it seems a rather Pollyanna-ish view um, that, that for us to, to, to assume that's going to happen. Which is why and I must get onto this because this is like from last week and I feel very strongly about it, this sort of thing is so dangerous. So we saw in The Guardian last week reported a letter from colleagues, many of whom I know, um, writing to the Secretary of State uh, in Miliband asking for him to pause, yet again, um, the initial rollout of carbon capture in the UK. A decision needs to be made by our government around now. They were going to make it in September. They haven't said anything, so... Um, well, uh, uh, you know, we, 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 we live in hope, um, uh, on whether or not to go ahead with the so-called Track 1 clusters for putting carbon dioxide back under the North Sea. And these, um, uh, it was a, actually, the, the, the Guardian headlined it, Climate Scientists. It was actually a collection of scientists and renewable energy uh, advocates and activists um, uh, that, were, that were writing to say they should um, pause, and I say yet again, because we've been here before, 
We were about to become world leaders in carbon capture and storage, carbon dioxide disposal, back in 2011, and then the government pulled the plug at the last minute after industry had invested um, tens of millions of pounds in the projects they were talking about. Same thing happened in 2015. Um, there, the government, it was they, they, they slipped the announcement out just at the beginning of the, Paris, the meeting for the Paris Agreement, so nobody noticed, or well, they hoped nobody would notice. And largely, they succeeded. Nobody did notice. I mean, I, I, I noticed. I was very sad, but no, nobody else can't seem to care for it very, very much. And so if they did it again for a third time, that would almost certainly be it for, um, for efforts to, to get rid of carbon dioxide on any scale in the UK economy. And this is dangerous because if we just look at what's required, and we're going to come back to this figure in later lectures, um, what the Climate Change Committee reckons we need to do to get to net zero in the UK, you know, a lot of it doesn't require carbon capture, but a big chunk of it does. Um, and, you know, if you eliminate carbon capture, if you take it off the table, um, you definitely increase the incentive to invest in renewables and demand reduction in the sense that um, back in the First World War, they sent um, pilots in, up in balsa wood aircraft without parachutes so as to focus their minds on the flight, on the fight. Um, this is true. Um, and, uh, uh, and it's a little bit like that. It's like, don't give them a parachute and they'll, they'll, work, they'll work harder. Um, unfortunately, I don't think that's what's going to happen because I think taking this off the table when this is the technology we need to get us that last mile to actually achieve net zero um, is actually makes it far more likely that climate policy fails altogether. Since I've got your attention, though, I can't resist saying, you know, a billion pounds, which is what we're arguing over here, that's the, the subsidy that the previous government promised these uh, Track 1 projects to get them going. It's, it's quite a lot of taxpayers' money, um, and at a time when you know, the government's just sort of cancelled winter fuel payments to pensioners, handing a cheque for a billion pounds essentially to the oil and gas industry is going to be tricky. You can see why it's a vulnerable decision at the moment. So if anybody's listening, um, you know, you, we do need to ask ourselves, is that really the way to do this? Um, who really benefits from a successful rollout of carbon capture? Well, obviously our grandchildren do because we stop global warming, um, but in addition, suppliers and users of fossil fuels definitely benefit. And this, of course, is why, because of course it means they can carry on selling their products for a little bit longer than they would be able to do so otherwise. Um, so, and this, of course, is why so many in the environmental movement really hate this technology, because it, it might mean that you know, life is not quite as difficult for the fossil fuel industry as they feel it should be. So why not fund the billion with a little tiny levy on all fossil fuels entering the UK economy, both domestic productions and imports? And one billion over three years is less than one pound per tonne of CO2. Remember those carbon prices I was talking about? They were, all like, they were already up at sort of 25, 50 pounds per tonne of CO2. This would be invisible. Very easy to do. We know exactly who's bringing carbon into the UK economy. They're all taxed already. One pound per tonne. You've solved the problem. You've got your billion, and you don't have to explain to the pensioners why you didn't give them the money and you gave it to an oil and gas company instead. That's less than half a penny per litre of petrol. So its impact on consumer prices would be invisible. I'm not the first to have had this idea. Um, well, we might argue about this because I've actually been going on about this for a while, but um, Chris Skidmore, uh, in his first, first public um, uh, uh, document, which actually proposed this um, in, the, in the Mission Zero review, government should consider setting fossil fuel producers operating domestically a storage obligation target. We're going to come back to this idea, but basically make the industry pay for it rather than pay for it, paying for it out of, taxpayers, uh, out, of the tax, out of the pocket of taxpayers. Um, that's, uh, to, we, we'll, we'll be coming back to this idea of making the industry pay. By the way, um, uh, just a, a, a looking ahead, um, the European Union actually has, for the first time, introduced an obligation on the fossil fuel industry to actually start building capacity uh, for carbon dioxide storage. So the first time actually anybody's actually required the fossil fuel industry to do anything about fixing the consequences of the product itself, which I think is truly historic. And, and um, remarkably, it was lobbied hard against by the fossil fuel industry, and they lost. That doesn't happen very often. Um, so hats off 
to the European Commission for standing its ground on that one. Um, and we're going, to, we're going to be coming back to this in the final lecture of this series where we talk about the concept of carbon take back and how, in my view, at least, we will stop fossil fuels from causing global warming eventually, um, having exhausted all the alternatives. So, net zero needs new climate policies. We can't just carry on by exactly the same policies, just dialed up to 11. Um, we need, starting down the road to net zero um, is a socioeconomic challenge. It's, it's, if you price carbon, you just adjust the economy to move away from high carbon sources of energy towards low carbon sources of energy. That's an efficient way of doing it. You, you, you know, the economists have got that one nailed. They, they, they know what they're doing to start emission. But getting there, getting all the way to net zero is primarily an engineering challenge. We need to build a capacity to get rid of carbon dioxide, to capture it either where it's generated or back out of the atmosphere and stick it permanently back underground. To put it this way, Climate policy needs an exit strategy. It's all very well, and this was a, a phrase, actually, I confess I came up with back in 2009 when everybody was fretting about exit strategies from Iraq and Afghanistan. And it was like, it's kind of quite easy to get into climate policy, to start reducing emissions. But you won't bring people with you unless you can tell them the whole story and that it's not just going to be ever-increasing pain going forward into the future. We need to be able to tell people the whole, the, 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 the full story of how our climate policy is going to succeed. And I believe it. So we actually used this in the title of a commentary, which I believe, looking back, may have actually been the first um, publication in the world to actually use the phrase net zero. Although, well, we said zero net uh, emissions. In the, we didn't actually say net zero emissions, but, but I'll take it. It's pretty close. Um, and uh, and, and, and where, we, where we pointed out that um, the, 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 in the end, it was the policies required to dispose of carbon dioxide that are going to make the difference between halting global warming and not. And it's that interplay between uh, the policies we have now and the policies we need in the future to get us all the way to net zero, which are going to be the topic of this year's Gresham Lectures. So please come to the other ones where we get into much more detail on how these work, but I hope that's given you an overview of the challenge ahead of us. Thank you. <laughs>